Hello, everybody. Welcome to Connection. So glad you were able to make it with us tonight. We appreciate it. We're going to give a few seconds here for others to come on board. Uh, I trust that you all have had a good week so far. I know that I've been out enjoying the weather and people I've talked to getting a lot of chores done around the house, in the house, outside the house, yard work, things like that. I think time all this is over with, most of us may have a brand new look at home as much as we've been working. I've been uh, putting in some screens and caulking around a window and cleaning out my shed and around the fence yard and, and the fence row, and things like that, getting things accomplished. And I'm sure you're doing the same. Of course, you know what happens this Sunday. This Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, praise God. Let me remind you that we're going to be taking communion this Sunday, so get the communion elements ready. Hallelujah. And next Wednesday night is Healing is Here. We're going to have a great time dealing with healing. We're going to, since we're doing this series on righteousness, we're going to combine next Wednesday night and talk about how you have a right to be healed. And the Son of Righteousness has arisen with healing in his wings. So don't miss that. Invite someone, people you know that are, that are sick, uh, have them tune in and be a part. I believe that God can heal through uh, through the internet, just as well as being uh, in our homes or at the, at the church. So please invite someone, and we're going to have a good, good time next Wednesday night as well. So be believing God with this for healings, and I am working as I talk to you on my phone here. There we go. There are my notes. Praise God. So good. So glad that you're here. I have an excitement in my spirit about our healing service next week. Of course, I think I always do. But I think you're going to see some uh, some really good things, some interesting things, some faith-building truths concerning righteousness and, and your healing and how you really do have a right to be healed. Praise God. Well, I hear that uh, some cooler weather's on the way. I hope you've been out. I was out today, went to the res and, and walked around. I went to the pond, did a two-mile walk. Last week I did a 10 mile walk and then the next day I did a 12 mile bike ride. So I'm, I'm enjoying this kind of weather. I, spring and fall are my, my two favorite times of year. Really enjoy them. I, I do like winter, but, but there's something about spring and fall I really enjoy. It's nice to work out in the yard and not break a real sweat because it's not 95 degrees. Hallelujah. Well, are you ready? Are you ready for the word? Before we get into the message tonight, let me remind you of something that we, we said last week as we began this series on righteousness. We made this statement, since you did not qualify for righteousness, you cannot disqualify from being righteous by sinning. That is a powerful truth to renew your mind to, to get into your spirit. Because so many times after we've been born again, been made the righteousness of God, when we slip and mess up, mess up, sometimes we think, man, there's no way I can be righteous anymore. There's just no way. But I'm telling you, you did not qualify for righteousness, and therefore you cannot disqualify from being righteous by sinning. You Positionally, you are the righteousness of God. It's been uh, imputed to you. It's been imparted into your spirit, but it's also put to your account. So legally you're right in God's sight and now that you're born again you've been made the righteousness of God so it's positionally yours and it's also vitally yours you cannot uh, get away get your uh, remove righteousness get it away from you just because you blow it your righteousness is a lot stronger than you yielding to your flesh amen and then the other thing I want to remind you of that we talked about last week I want to pull up this here it is this note we said this last week, any area of your life that you are condemning yourself, faith cannot go to work in that area. And I want to remind you that. I want you to hold on to that. I don't know how your week's been thinking about righteousness, meditating on it, giving God thanks for it. This is so, so important. If there's any area of your life that you're dis dissatisfied with, you're not, not pleased with at all, I'm telling you, any area of your life that you are condemning yourself, faith cannot go to work in that area. Why? because faith cannot work in an atmosphere of condemnation. I remember years ago as a teen, that's a, a revelation God spoke to my heart one day as I was studying on righteousness. He said, faith cannot work in an atmosphere of condemnation. So I just want to give you those, those two reminders from last week. 
and also give an opportunity for more to, uh, to come on with us today. All right, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for your word tonight. We love it. We appreciate it. And Father, we open up our hearts. We receive your word tonight. And we're depending upon the Holy Spirit to reveal truth to us, for our faith to come up, be, to be made stronger, for our spirit man to be stronger. Father, I thank you for the righteousness of God that we have when we are born again. So thank you for a revelation of it. Thank you for the grace, the empowerment to live this life of righteousness. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome to part two in our series, Right Standing with God. And tonight, I want to talk to you about, and this is the title of the message, Walking in Your Righteousness. Walking in Your Righteousness. Let's go tonight to Isaiah 32. This, I think, will probably be our foundation scriptures for this series. Isaiah 32, we'll read verses 15 through 18. Isaiah 32, 15 through 18. This is awesome, awesome passage of scripture right here. <clears throat> Very descriptive of righteousness. Isaiah 32, 15 through 18. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Praise God. When righteousness is at work in your life, you have peace. Don't underestimate that, that statement. When righteousness is at work in your life, you have peace. First of all, you have peace with God. Then you have peace in yourself. You have peace with yourself. You have peace with others. And no situation can rattle your life. Nothing that happens can just shake your cage and rattle your life you are at peace. There is a rest on the inside of you when you have a revelation that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Christians who are always restless, always striving, always at work on something are not established in their righteousness. Now, I know that's, a, that's kind of a big statement, but let me say it to you like this, and this is a question I want to ask you tonight. Are you performance-based or relationship-based? That may be an ouch for some of you. Are you, perf you performance-based or relationship-based? In your walk with God, your relationship with Him, is it based on your performance or is it based on the fact that He is your father, you're His son or daughter, and He loves you? Are you always working, always working, always trying to cut the mustard, always trying to do something? Are you performance-based are relationship based and is that that same question applies to your relationships because here's what I found out <clears throat> if you are performance based with God you're probably going to be performance based with others but if you're relationship based with God then you're probably going to be relationship based with others now not always but it's a good strong indicator that if you're relationship based with God you're going to be relationship based with others only righteousness can bring you to that place where you're no, you're no longer striving to please God. You're not basing this thing on your performance, but you're at rest in the fact that you have a relationship with God Almighty. That is a place of rest. That is a place of quietness. That is a place of assurance. And that's a very good place to be. Amen. All right, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 8 tonight. <clears throat> We're going to read over in Romans 8. I think some of you are still asking yourself the question, am I relationship-based? Am I performance-based? And, and you will know, you'll know right off the bat which one you are. And if you're performance-based, 
you know, that, that, that needs to change by the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I was there, man. I grew up Pentecostal. We, we were performance-based, and it took me a long time to get out of that. And there's still at times that that tries to come back into me where I think, okay, God's going to accept me based on what I do today, or he was not going to be pleased if I don't do this. And so that some of that still can, can get in there and, and, and attach itself to me, and I got to go, wait, wait, wait. It's not based on, on my performance. You know, before we go to Romans 8 and read this, <clears throat> in all reality, if you stop and think about this, if you are trying to work your way to God, his favor, his loving you, in all reality, that's just a slap in the face of Jesus in what he's done for you. The things that he's accomplished for you far outweigh everything that you would ever do. I mean, you you put everything, all your good works together, pile it up, and then pile that up next to what Jesus has done for you. And it, it's just a slap in the face. It, it pales in comparison. So we really need to stop trying to be performance-based and just rest in who we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 8. Let's read verses 1 through 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, I want you to catch this, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. The law could not fix the sin problem. The law could not fix the sin problem. Let me tell you something about the law. There was nothing about it that was perfect. Nothing. And that's why God had it temporary. That's why he was not pleased with it, is because it was imperfect. The law could not fix the sin problem, and it still can't. It could make you more aware of the sin problem, but it couldn't fix it. There's only one fix to the sin problem. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus took care of the sin problem. Now, you may know, not know what the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is yet, but I'm telling you that that is the fix because that's righteousness. Praise God. We're here in Romans chapter 8. Look at chapter 6, Romans 6 and verse 23. So just back up a couple chapters there. Praise God. More people are coming online. That's awesome. Hello, everybody. Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin and death is a law. You sin, you die. If you sin, you deserve to be punished for those sins. To be, <clears throat> I want to, I got to slow down here. I'm getting all excited. Somebody wants to write that down. Sin and death is a law. You sin, you die. You deserve to be punished for your sins. To be condemned means to be found guilty. Don't you think about that? To be condemned means to be found guilty. If you're condemned, you are deserving of punishment. Being condemned means the trial is over, the gavel has come down, and you have been found guilty. Now it's time for punishment. And from punishment, the result is death. That is the law of sin and death. Condemned. Not fit for use. Not fit for God to occupy. The only thing you're good for is to go to hell. That's the law of sin and death. The law demands that if you sin, you must pay for it. You must die unless somebody else is willing to step in and take your place. Hallelujah. We're at Romans chapter 6, back up to chapter 5, verse 1. 
kind of backwards from the book of Romans here. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. One more time. Therefore, being justified. Somebody said this one time years ago, and I'll never forget it. Justified, just if I'd never sin. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. Does that remind you of Isaiah that we read? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified is the opposite of condemned. I'm going to want to write this down. This is really good news. Justified, cleared of all charges. Hallelujah. Cleared of all charges of all wrongdoing. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm getting all kinds of explosions on the screen and thumbs up and hearts. Amen. Justified, cleared of all charges of all wrongdoing. You have been cleared of all charges. You have been cleared of all wrongdoing. You have been justified. Justified is another word for righteousness. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor tonight as we, as we get into this. I want to lead you in some strong confessions, and I want you to be bold enough to say this with me. Are you ready? I am undeserving of any punishment. I am undeserving of any punishment. One more time. I am undeserving of any punishment. <laughs> Boy, that just rubs religion wrong, doesn't it? That's just like, that can't be, that can't be. Oh, yes, it can be, and praise God it is, because we've been justified. Praise the Lord. You cannot be persuaded, you cannot be too persuaded of your righteousness. It's one of my favorite sentences. You cannot be too persuaded of your righteousness. You just can't be. You just can't be. Now, whenever you deal with righteousness, there's always somebody that's going to think or say, you know, Phil, I appreciate your enthusiasm and your excitement, but listen, you're, you're making too light of sin. Well, here's, here's the answer. To minimize sin is to minimize the sacrifice for sin. To minimize sin is is to minimize the sacrifice for sin. Sin is a big deal. It's a huge deal. But the sacrifice is a whole lot bigger. Amen. Yeah, sin's a big deal, but what Jesus did for us is bigger than sin. It trumps it. No pun intended. <laughs> but it's far, far greater. It far outweighs it. I'm not making light of sin. Sin's a big deal. But what Jesus did for us is far greater. Glory to God. Now, the innocent do not get punished. Why, why? Why would you punish the innocent? I mean, I know uh, talking about this COVID-19 and is it, is it the wrath of God or not? When you have a 98% uh, recovery rate from COVID-19, that is not the wrath of God, all right? When God pours out his wrath, you read the book of Revelation, no one's going to say, I wonder if it is or if I wonder if it isn't. Everybody's going to know when God pours out his wrath, and this virus is not the wrath of God. When my boys were being raised, I never spanked them for doing what's right. That would be child abuse, right? The innocent do not get punished. As the righteousness of God in Christ, you are innocent of all charges. So therefore, you don't get punished. All right, here's another confession. Because I believe in Jesus... I am not guilty. Because I believe in Jesus, I am not guilty. One more time. Because I believe in Jesus, I am not guilty. It would do you a world of good to spend a whole day just going around saying to yourself, I am not guilty. I am not guilty. I am not guilty. Because you're not. Because the blood of Jesus has wiped all that out. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Are your sins paid for? Oh, I tell you what, the Baptists are big on this. The Pentecostals are big on this. Oh, Jesus paid for our sins. Well, if your sins are paid for, then you have no punishment coming. That's right. If they're paid for, then you're free from punishment because Jesus bore your punishment. 
There's something about righteousness. It'll it'll feed your spirit. It'll make you. It'll put meat on you on your bones, spiritually speaking. It so infuses you. It it builds faith in you. Righteousness will put meat on you spiritually. It is powerful stuff. Jesus condemned sin because sin was condemning us. Yep, you want to write that one down too, don't you? Jesus condemned sin, and that was that was Romans 8, 3. Jesus condemned sin because sin was condemning us. Now, here's another one. This is strong. <clears throat> Believers are blameless and shameless. That's absolutely true. Believers are blameless and shameless. Though most do not believe this or live this way, it's still true. So I want you to say with me, I am blameless, I am shameless. I am blameless, I am shameless. I am blameless, I am shameless. Isn't it sad how many Christians live their life with shame? Those who live that way have no revelation of the righteousness of God. Because here's the truth. Either you're forgiven and you're righteous or you're guilty. Either you're innocent or you're guilty. And by being born again and making Jesus the Lord of your life, you are now innocent. You're free from all charges. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Read with me in John chapter 3. John 3, 17. We all can quote John 3, 16. But I want us to look at John 3, 17. Come on, say it again. I am blameless and I am shameless. John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God is not interested in finding us guilty. I remember years ago, a preacher said this, and it really stayed with me. He said, God's not trying to keep people out of heaven. He's trying to keep people in. He's trying to get people into heaven. God is not interested in finding us guilty. He came to justify us. He came to make us righteous. Jesus did not come to fix the blame. He came to fix the problem. Amen. Jesus did not come to fix the blame. He came to fix the problem. And praise God he did, didn't he? If you are conscious of your past, then you are not conscious of your righteousness. Uh, if you want to say ouch, oh me, and amen, go right ahead. That's fine. If you are conscious of your past, then you are not conscious of your righteousness. <clears throat> now, here's another one. This is a strong application. If you are conscious of others' judgment and condemnation, then you're not conscious of the not guilty verdict, the justification that belongs to you. How many of us have gotten to a place where maybe we're free from guilt between us and the Lord? We know that we've been justified, but we allow other people's condemnation and their judgment to come upon us, and we accept it. That's wrong, my brothers and sisters. If God has justified you, who would dare condemn you? Amen. So you have no right to receive their guilt, their condemnation on you. You need to be more aware of your righteousness. When you submit to righteousness, you reject others condemning you. <clears throat> Thank you for writing that down. I know that somebody's, a couple of people are taking that down. When you submit to righteousness, you reject others condemning you. When you submit to righteousness, you reject thoughts and feelings of guilt sin, and unworthiness. 
When you submit to righteousness, and I'm talking about the righteousness of God that you were made in Christ Jesus when you were born again, all right? I'm talking about that kind of righteousness. When you submit to righteousness, you reject thoughts and feelings of guilt, sin, and unworthiness. If you've been made righteous, then you are worthy. And how many Christians talk about, oh, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Oh, I'm so unworthy. You may have been unworthy when you were a sinner, but now that you're a Christian, Jesus has made you worthy. You are worthy to receive the blessings of God. You're worthy to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. You're worthy to receive the gifts of the Spirit. You're worthy to be healed. You're worthy to prosper financially. That's not being braggadocious on yourself. You're bragging on Jesus. You're bragging on what he's done for you. You're a new creature in Christ. That old unworthiness is gone. You're made worthy now that you're a new creature. Praise God. So Jesus did not come to condemn. He came to save. That's what we need to be about. We need to be about the, the salvation business, not the condemning business. And I'm kind of getting ahead of myself there. Okay, let's turn over to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and verse number 1. Praise the Lord. First John chapter 2, verse 1. This is... If you're going to walk in your righteousness, you've got to know this verse. You, you've got to know it. You've got to be able to, to apply this to your life. And I'll show you how here in just a moment. First John chapter 2, that little bitty book there toward the end of the Bible. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father... Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hallelujah. Jesus is your advocate. Do you know what that means? That means a defense attorney. Jesus is your defense attorney. You have the best defense attorney that's ever been in existence. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's never lost a case. He's never lost a case. He is your advocate. He is advocating for you. He is praying for you. Hallelujah. Never lost a case if you only say what he tells you to say. <laughs> if you're going to walk in your righteousness, you're going to need to receive the present day ministry of Jesus as your advocate, as your defense attorney. Now, what he does is this. When you, when you blow it, if you sin, then you repent. You ask God to forgive you and cleanse you in the name of Jesus. Then you turn to Jesus, your advocate. Are you listening? You turn to Jesus, your advocate, and you say, Jesus, I'm asking you to restore to me my sense of righteousness. There's no need in you going days and days feeling guilty and beat up and unworthy and condemned because you messed up and you yielded to your flesh. That doesn't give God any more glory, and that's not any greater level of repentance if you go around feeling guilty. The only thing you should feel bad about is not feeling bad. <laughs> All right? So Jesus, restore to me my sense of righteousness. Jesus, thank you for your present-day ministry as my advocate, and he will be the best defense attorney you've ever had. Glory to God. But you're going to only, you have to only say what he tells you to say. I want to, I want to say this again. As the righteousness of God in Christ, you are innocent of all charges. So then what, what do you plead? Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, just check me for a moment. As a believer, when you sin, how does that affect your righteousness? When you sin, you have the right to repent. Jesus and the Father have a right to forgive you. What gives them the right to forgive you and cleanse you? What Jesus did. What gives you the right to repent and receive that forgiveness and cleansing? What Jesus did. You have the right to repent. I just uh, watched uh, Adam 12. Remember the old TV show, Adam 12? I was watching a little bit of that. Uh, Adam 12, Adam 12. 
you are to plead not guilty. After you've repented, after you've asked Jesus to be your advocate, restore to you that sense of righteousness, you need to plead not guilty. I know it's not what religion teaches. Religion teaches you need to be a, feel like a dirty dog for, for days on end. I'm telling you, if you're going to live in victory, you must learn to live free from guilt and condemnation. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So you must plead the blood. You must plead you're innocent, that you're not guilty. This is strong. How innocent are you? As innocent as Jesus is. I want that to soak into you. How innocent are you? You're as innocent as Jesus is. Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He became your righteousness, glory to God. In order for you to walk in your righteousness, you must confess it. And you must reject all thoughts and feelings that are contrary to your righteousness. It is vitally important to your faith and to your walk with the Lord that you confess boldly, I am the righteousness of God. I'm telling you, that doesn't give you a free ride to sin. That strengthens your spirit so you can resist sin. Remember the scripture we looked at last week in 1 Corinthians 15? Awake to righteousness and sin not. The more you realize that you've been made the righteousness of God, this world and the things of this world will have no appeal to you. It just won't have that pull, that draw on you because you've already found something that has satisfied you and that is being in right standing with God. Hallelujah. All right. We need to confess our righteousness. We need to reject all thoughts and feelings of guilt and unworthiness. James chapter 4. We're kind of close by there. Back up to James 4 and 17. Well, let's look at another aspect here of of walking in our righteousness. James 4 and 17. <clears throat> Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Well, sin is sin, right? No. Notice the phrase, to him. Not everybody has the same light or knowledge. This is why we are not to judge each other. I do not know what light you have. You don't know what light I have. The more light you have, the more the, more the Lord holds you responsible, and he expects more out of you. This is why we're to have nothing to do with the condemnation business. You have no right. I have no right to judge other people because you don't know what type of light they have. You don't know the amount of light they have. You don't know what areas of light they have. And to have light, you have to have revelation knowledge. I can say something to you and you can mentally agree and go, oh, yeah, yeah, right, that's true. But if it's not a revelation to you, then you're not walking in the light of that. So I have no right to judge you. You have no right to judge me because you don't know my amount of light. To him, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To be uh, to condemn, we talk about not being in the condemnation business. Condemnation, to be down and against, to find someone guilty, we're not to have any part of that. If you're going to walk in your righteousness, you must stop judging and condemning others. Hallelujah. We've all been guilty. We all have repented. So Lord, forgive me. You know, for some it's been a habit and it's a bad habit, but we can break it in the name of Jesus. If you're going to walk in your righteousness, you must stop judging and condemning others. You don't know what they see. Don't condemn others. Don't be condemned. And don't sin. Amen. Another reason why it's difficult for Christians to walk in their righteousness is that there's not enough teaching today in the church on the blood of Jesus. And that's something that we've taught here at Connections. It's something that we're big on. We talk a lot about it. People 
struggle with guilt and condemnation because they've gotten their eyes off of the blood and onto their mess and onto their sins. The blood of Jesus, I want you to hear me, the blood of Jesus is greater than your sins. Past, present, and future, the blood of Jesus is greater. And I know I say this a lot, but it's so true. You've got to come to the place where you decide which one's greater. Is the blood of Jesus greater or is my mess greater? Even if it's not just past sins, maybe you're, you're hung up in something and you're, you're continually sinning. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus has the power to set you free. You've been made righteous. This just messes with Christians' head because they don't understand and it really messes with, with religious people that you can still be righteous as a Christian and sin at the same time. And the reason why they don't understand that is this. It's your spirit that's righteous. Your, your flesh, your soul, and your body, your mind needs to, be, need, needs to be renewed and your body needs to be trained. As your mind is renewed, your soul and body is going to side in with your spirit. That's the righteousness of God. And that's part of growing up in the things of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's hard to feel guilty when you have a revelation of his blood. Let me say that again. It is hard to feel guilty when you have a revelation of his blood. It is hard to sin when you have a revelation of his blood. Hallelujah. There is nothing more glorious that I'm, that I'm aware of than being made the righteousness of God. It gives you access to God. It gives you access to the things of God. Think about this. And I've been, I've been meditating on this today, some in, in my walks and, and things I've been doing today. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you are in right standing with God, you're right with him then there's no reason for him to withhold anything from you. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a wonderful thought. That's a faith-building thought. If you are in right standing with God, then there's no reason for him to withhold anything from you. And the Bible says in the book of Romans, well, I got to turn there. Hallelujah. Romans 8, let's go there. I, I don't want to quote this. I want to read this to you. This is wonderful. We're, we're, we're going to close here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 and verse number 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you are in right standing with God, he freely gives you all things. God is not withholding anything from you because you are right with him. You're the righteousness of God in him. So the answer is yes. I'm telling you, righteousness will give you the ability to receive from him. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Well, I don't know who all is watching me tonight, so I'm going to say this to you. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you've never been made righteous, now is the time to get right with God. And all you have to do is just pray this prayer with me to say, oh God in heaven, I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. It's just that easy. Welcome to the family of God. All of your past has been washed away by the blood. You're a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And you are now the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Love you and the Lord. We'll see you Sunday morning for Resurrection Sunday. Be blessed and enjoy your righteousness.